Uh, hello. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Hugo. Um, I will be talking a little bit about hardware virtualization and what changed in the last decade. Um, I'm a systems engineer at a small cloud provider called DigitalOcean. Sorry, had to put this somewhere. Um, so, uh, why do we virtualize hardware? Uh, apart from the right answers that the CTOs and CEOs like server consolidation, far, faster provisioning, and faster recovery, um, from the geeky side, some operational tasks became much easier. We can live migrate ser virtual servers between servers. We can have uh, virtually uh, zero down downtime maintenance windows. And virtual machines are really nice dev environments. At least rebooting a, a VM is much faster than booting a normal computer. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking a, a little bit about uh, why hardware virtualization is useful, um, because it's not exactly required. Well, nowadays it actually is. Uh, so, um, the easier way to virtualize is just emulate everything, literally everything. Uh, we have instructions, we do uh, instruction by instruction interpretation, all the hardware state is emulated in software, like RAM is just a block of allocated memory, registers are just uh, variables, and so on and so on. This is extremely simple. Uh, it could be easy enough to be a university assignment if you are not implementing a CISC instruction set at least. Um, but it's really slow. Really, really slow. Uh, nevertheless, it's very useful for development. Uh, the most famous emulator is probably a box that started in 94 and the last commit was one day ago, so I believe people are still using it. So, um, uh, instruction by instruction emulation is actually not feasible in the production environment uh, because we expect the, the down speed to uh, to be not that significant. Um, so there are faster ways to virtualize even without um, without hardware support. Um, but first, let's make a little detour. Um, who here heard about the term um, virtual machine monitor? Ah, interesting. Um, any idea in which decade that term was coined? <laughs> yep. Um, so in the 70s, actually in 74, uh, Popek and Goldberg wrote a paper uh, with the title Formal Requirements for Virtualizable Third Generation Architectures. Um, the paper abstract mentioned things like PDP-10 and IBM 360. Um, uh, Popek and, uh, and uh, Goldberg in this paper established the base requirements to consider a virtual machine monitor a virtual machine monitor. Um, so uh, a fidelity uh, is just that the behavior uh, from the guest's perspective should be similar to the host perspective. And the guest is not supposed to understand or perceive in any way that it's a guest, uh, that is a virtualized um, a thing. Uh, a performance is a little bit subjective here, but uh, in the paper it, it was very obvious that it meant that uh, emulation or plain emulation was not an option. So the, the virtualization uh, overhead was supposed to be close to neglectable. 
Um, and safety, I guess, is obvious. The, the guest VMs uh, must coexist between each other and should not interfere um, with uh, uh, the virtual machine monitor and with the resources that they don't have access to or they, they are not supposed to have access to. So these are the requirements. Um, Poppen and Goldberg, also in the same paper, came up with a couple of theorems. We are going to put our focus in the first theorem. And it is, uh, for any conventional third-generation computer, a virtual machine monitor might, may be constructed if the set of sensitive instructions for that computer is a subset of the set of privileged instructions. So uh, my big question on the, about this was, what is a third-generation computer? Since this paper was written in the 70s, well, different expectations. Um, but this is also made very explicit uh, in the paper. Uh, it should have some sort of relocation mechanism, uh, which makes sense because similar VMs are supposed to share the same space. Um, the instruction set is uh, expected to have uh, different privilege levels, so a supervisor and a user mode, and um, a trap mechanism or set of trap mechanisms are also required. Um, now, uh, what's the meaning of sensitive instructions and privilege instructions? Um, so, privilege instructions um, are those that trap if the processor is in user mode and do not trap in system mode or in supervisor mode. And um, sensitive instructions, um, when trapped, must pass the control to the virtual machine monitor. And uh, now, the, the su uh, suggestion or the proposed uh, way of virtualizing virtual, uh, virtual machines is nowadays called um, classic virtualization. And the co concept is very, very simple. Uh, we are supposed to directly execute the safe instructions, and by safe, um, we mean that they don't interfere with the virtual machine monitor or any other VMs. Um, and uh, we are expected to trap and emulate the privileged instructions. Now, how does this apply to hardware? Um, a curiosity, uh, is any of you going to Prague next week? Okay, this might be safe then. Uh, you'll, will you be attending Embedded Linux Conf? Okay, so about hardware. Um, ARM exists, but we'll be ignoring it for today. And uh, this is going to be very specific to Intel. Um, I'm not going to mention AMD. They have very similar uh, uh, visualization capabilities. Uh, even if they are incompatible at the instruction set level. Uh, so, um, how this classical virtualization could work on x86? Um, so, uh, x86 already has uh, four privilege levels, which is very useful. Uh, those privilege uh, levels go from ring 0 to ring 3. Uh, ring 0 is the actual privilege levels, and uh, rings 1 to 3 are not privileged. Um, this means that if we try to uh, execute a privilege instruction on rings 1 to 3, it will trap, and the virtual machine monitor will regain control. And when that happens, it is supposed to emulate the, the instruction that actually caused the trap and give control back to the virtualized OS. So from the privilege levels perspective or rings, uh, the virtual machine monitor uh, and possibly the, the operating system kernel runs on ring zero, so in privilege, real privilege mode. Um, the user line uh, runs on ring three 
and a visualized OS could run on Ring 1. Um, probably that virtualized OS uh, that we don't know uh, which OS could be, would use Ring 3 as well to, to run its Etherland code. Um, I should mention that uh, in terms of data access, Ring 0 has access to everything. Ring 2 has, uh, Ring 1 has access to the, or can see and access the data in the uh, Rings uh, 2 and 3 and, and so on. Uh, so, um, let's pick a random x86 instruction. Okay, it's not really random. Um, a pop flags. Um, pop flags is a very interesting instruction because when we run it in privileged mode, it changes the um, ALU and the system flags. And when we run it in non privileged mode, only the LU is changed. So uh, its behavior depends on the, the um, current privilege level, which makes it challenging because there is no way for the virtual machine monitor to intercept its execution. And uh, the ideal scenar scenario would be uh, the execution would be uh, intercepted by the VMM, uh, you, to check the, the guest's uh, current privilege level and it would either emulate it in privilege mode or non-privilege mode from the guest perspective. But since this instruction doesn't trap, that is not possible. Um, x86 has uh, in total 17 non-privilege sensitive, sensitive instructions which means uh, they don't actually trap and we would expect it to, at least for a classical virtualization to work. And additionally, uh, we can easily, or the guest operating system can easily uh, know if it is being virtualized or not. Uh, because the, uh, uh, the privilege level uh, is stored in the two uh, lower bits of uh, the, um, in the CS uh, register. So uh, this is bad news because this means that x86 can't be classically virtualized without hardware uh, support. However, we have been using uh, fast uh, emulators way before having uh, hardware virtualization available. And this has been done uh, by uh, doing binary translation. Uh, the, the idea is, is extremely simple. Uh, the implementation is actually not that simple. But the idea is um, uh, there is uh, a mechanism inside the, the VMM that dynamically translates the sensitive instructions so they are uh, they cause a trap and the virtual machine monitor uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, running those instruction, uh, instructions directly uh, emulates their behavior um, and uh, and uh, mimics the side effects of that execution to the guest. Um, as an optimization and a required optimization, the translated blocks have to be cached, which sounds simple, but is actually not simple when we consider corner cases like self-modifying code. And um, we need a few things like shadow page tables. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, in a few minutes. Um, and the, uh, all the I.O. is emulated as well. Um, so it's not trivial, uh, but it was a fast solution for some years. Uh, I guess the first uh, actual uh, working uh, virtual machine uh, monitor using binary translation that was really fast was VM VMware Workstation uh, that was re released in 99 or 2000. So um, eventually, 
a few years later, 2005 or 2006, Intel started having support for hardware virtualization. And um, what they did was uh, adding a new mode of execution uh, that is called by them root mode. Uh, and the virtual machine monitor would run, uh, run in uh, root mode and uh, the, um, uh, the guests would run in non-root mode. Uh, the guests would be totally unaware about their execution mode. Actually, they uh, uh, so Intel VTX adds a new a new set of instructions, and the guests wouldn't be able to run any of those in, new instruc instructions without uh, trapping back into the the VMM. Um, except one, actually, um, but not important for now. Um, so, yeah, the guests are totally unaware about what's going on. They just run their code and uh, they don't need to do anything else. Now, how VTX actually works. Uh, so, each guest has uh, its own control structure that has all the state. Uh, and a little bit more. Um, the transitions between uh, root and non-root mode are atomic. Um, the virtual machine monitor uh, has a very simple job. It creates a, a VM control structure. Um, it's, it's not a trivial structure, uh, but it feels uh, things like uh, the initial guest state, uh, how the registers look like. It has to provide some memory uh, space context. Um, then it sets an, an uh, uh, program counter and it just launches the VM. And when it launches the VM, the VM or the, the processor uh, transits to non-root mode and it stays in non-root mode, uh, running the guest's code until a uh, VM exit happens. Now, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, um, back here. Uh, the VMCS also specifies in which conditions a VM exit should happen. And this makes things very, very interesting. We can easily fine tune the um, the guest to uh, to exit only in very specific conditions, and I'm going to to talk a little bit about which uh, what are the typical um, exit reasons. Uh, so uh, we can have uh, multiple VMCSs, uh, but in a single point in time, there is only one active VMCS. So the, a single core, um, and I'm, I'm talking about cores and not processors, because each core can have its own active VMCS. Or, uh, and uh, in a single point in time, the core is either in root mode or in non-root mode. If it's in non-root mode, uh, it's running a, a guest. And uh, once it, it uh, VM exits back to root mode, the, the VMM might decide to schedule another, a different virtual machine to that same core. And it just uh, appoints the, the VMCS pointer to another VMCS structure and starts that virtual machine or resumes that virtual machine. Um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this graph, I'm using VM entry as a generalization of VM resume or VM start, actually it's VM launch. Um, and uh, yep, so we have an easy, uh, easy way to run uh, guest code um, safely. Uh, without, uh, and uh, this can be uh, considered uh, classic virtualization. Well, kind of. So, um, we can easily emulate CPU. Um, 
now uh, we need to talk about the MMU. Um, in the initial reasons, uh, in, in the initial, in, well, sorry, uh, in the initial uh, releases of VTX um, or the initial one, uh, the first one in 2000, 2006, uh, the MMU could not be virtualized, and that is uh, was bad because there has to be something. Um, translating or managing uh, the page tables. So the page tables are simply the mapping into uh, from virtual memory to physical memory. But since we have a virtual machine inside the inside something that is real, we need two uh, layers of translation. Uh, translation. So from the um, the virtual machine, uh, a virtual memory to the virtual machine physical memory, but that physical memory seen uh, by the, the virtual machine is actually a uh, virtual memory from the VMM's perspective. Then there is also the translation uh, from the host level or the VMM level uh, from that uh, virtual, uh, virtual memory to actual physical memory. Uh, and the solution for that uh, was uh, shadow page tables. And this has lots of performance implications. So shadow page tables uh, consists on keeping the mapping or uh, in an in a optimal way, uh, the guest operating system would be managing the, the page tables and everything would work out of the box. But since there is no MMU virtualization, the VMM has to take the mappings provided um, from the, the guest operating system and uh, map those mappings to actual physical memory and use that as uh, as and appointing uh, uh, the the VM's uh, um, page table registry to uh, to that uh, shadow page tables. Um, this is going to make more sense in a second. Uh, so this mapping has to be kept in sync. So every time that uh, the the page tables change on the guest the VMM has to update them, it has to update the, the shadow page tables. Um, this means that every time the page tables registry uh, register changes on the guest, uh, it causes a VM exit. And uh, it gets worse than this. Um, when a new, um, a new memory page is added, to the page tables, the VMM has to keep track of changes to that page table. This means that every time that we or the guest M maps something that changes um, in the uh, specific page table, uh, it also causes a VM exit. Uh, this is lots of VM exits and Oh, I guess uh, I should mention that every time that there is a context switch in the in the guest operating system, uh, it causes uh, uh, the uh, the page tables uh, register changes. Um, here I wrote CR3. I don't know why. Um, and yeah, this is uh, lots of VM exits. And in the uh, the earlier versions of VDX. Uh, uh, VM exit, VM resume would take around 4,000 cycles, CPU cycles. In theory, we could measure uh, VM exit, VM re resume in microseconds, which is pretty uncool. So eventually, MMU virtualization arrived, and Intel called that extended page tables. Um, uh, some uh, the formal name, fancy name is second level address translation. Uh, some people also call them nested page tables. So, oops, 
Uh, so they were introduced in 2008, so a couple of years after VTX uh, first introduction, and um, it makes all the the, the work for us. Uh, when a TLB miss happens, um, it walks the guest uh, page table entries and the host page table entries for us, and that's all we wanted, right? Um, Obviously, uh, that doesn't require as many VM exits as before. So um, uh, every uh, the the guest manages uh, its own page tables, and that doesn't cause a VM exit. Um, and the the performance gains when compared to uh, shadow page tables were very obvious. Um, so uh, we are in 2008. The situation report. Um, we have a really nice CPU virtualization. Uh, the MMU is guest friendly, so everything is awesome. Um, I still find this music extremely catchy. Uh, sort of. Um, so there are multiple situations that can cause a VM exit. Um, the 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 Typical reasons are uh, exceptions, uh, CPU exceptions, uh, external interrupts, um, the execution of root sensitive instructions, uh, VTX instructions, IO instructions, lots of things. Um, the, the VMM has, uh, can avoid some of the exits because it can, um, uh, it can uh, literally cherry pick uh, uh, plenty of conditions that uh, trigger a VM exit, but uh, some of them it can't uh, can't be ignored. And uh, usually, uh, when a VM exit happens, uh, the the virtual machine monitor uh, looks into the into the uh, virtual machine control structure. Uh, it has a field exit reason. And uh, that exit reason is like an exit status code. Um, and uh, the virtual machine monitor knows what triggered the, the exception. But usually, that is not enough. Uh, that instruction has to be emulated, and uh, the, uh, the guest state has to be updated somehow, or something has to happen, right? So this means that to actually um, handle VM exits properly, we need to, to have x86 emulator uh, in our VMM, um, which are not very trivial. Um, a curiosity, any of you compiled uh, x86 emulator in the last month? Interesting. Any of you compiled a kernel in the last month? Okay. Any of you compiled an x86 without knowing it in the last month? I guess you did. So uh, the KVM code that is in the kernel, um, I, I, yeah, I can talk a little bit about KVM. Um, uh, the KVM code that, uh, that we have in the kernel uh, actually has uh, a minimal emulator that handles VM exits uh, successfully. Um, the KVM module uh, does most of the work for us in terms of um, keeping track of a virtual machine state. Um, there are different implementations, so the Intel VTX has been improved over the years. Uh, then there is this incompatible uh, AMD implementation, and uh, the KVM module handles all that for, uh, for us. And it's really simple to use, we just need to uh, there is a device file, uh, the FKVM, and uh, we can play with it uh, using IOCTLs. And, and that's what uh, QMU uh, uses. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about IO. Um, 
all the devices exposed to the guest are emulated. Uh, since one of the requirements is that the guest should be able to be a complete and modified system, uh, we need to, to provide some device that the guest knows how to deal with. Um, usually, this means providing uh, or emulating very old devices like um, uh, Intel E1000 or RTL8139 or NE2000 uh, because pretty much every uh, operating system has built-in uh, built drivers for those devices. Uh, the way I.O. works uh, is actually very simple. Um, when the guest uh, does any I.O. operation, and it can be PIO or MMIO, um, the VMM uh, games control uh, emulates whatever the, it's expected to happen from that emulated device and uh, gives control back to the, to the guest. This means that um, sometimes a single, a single I.O. operation might require multiple VM exits, mostly because we are emulating devices that were not thought to be used uh, in, a, in a virtualization environment. And so high throughput is impossible in this scenario. Um, this didn't used to be a, a big deal until a couple of years ago with the whole, uh, the whole cloud boom. Uh, mostly because you don't want to, even if you are a cloud provider, you don't want to have a virtual machine spending 30% uh, of its time uh, in a cycle VM exit, uh, VM resume, uh, just because uh, the user in the, inside that guest is downloading a file at 5 megs per second. Uh, yes, it's that bad. Um, so, uh, a decade ago, I guess it was actually a couple of years ago, um, a smart guy called Rusty Russell suggested something called Virt.io, that is a uh, pair virtualized I.O. I remember I mentioned that we didn't want to change our guests, but this happened for a good reason. Um, so. Instead of emulating a full device, uh, Virt.io just suggested that uh, a si very simple PCI device uh, was enough, uh, and that would be okay for all or most of the device classes that uh, we could have some interest in on, on having access from the guest. Um, the way it works is very simple. So there is a specific device, the guest knows how to deal with it, um, and uh, it exposes uh, just one or n ring buffers, and those ring buffers are, are shared with the, the VMM and are used as communication channel between the guest and the host. Um, the, the, the VMM or the backend side of that device provides the actual I.O. operation. Uh, Virt.io became supported by multiple hypervisors and I guess any major operating system nowadays has Virt.io drivers at least for network cards and probably something else, but I like network cards. Um, and this improved things uh, significantly. Um, uh, still not as uh, performance-wise, still not as good as native hardware, but it was much better than ha having an emulated device. Uh, I guess uh, the uh, one could easily reach like a speed up of 20x uh, network-wise, which was a lot. Eventually, uh, hardware higher virtualization became a requirement, and 
uh, I don't have slides about this, so I'm going to do some talking. Uh, and uh, the the basic functionality just allows uh, the VMM to safely assign or dedicate uh, a device uh, to to a virtual machine. That by itself is not very useful because, okay, it's useful if you want to play Quake in your VM, in your desktop, using your graphics card. Uh, but in a cloud environment, usually the number of VMs uh, scale much better than the number of devices that you, uh, you have to actually uh, assign. Um, I also, uh, also uh, I guess, since the first implementation of or uh, release of hardware, native hardware, um, IO virtualization, uh, things were uh, really already optimized, and we could get to a state where vir there were virtually no VM exits triggered by IO. Um, there are a few tricks to make that happen and a few exemptions, but it was already technically possible. So uh, we could uh, get to, for example, close to line speed network-wise and uh, a, few f uh, a new family of um, uh, virtualized devices uh, started appearing since then. Um, but this is not really that interesting in, in, in the with the, the whole cloud thingy today. So um, and the, the PCI-C came with a really nice uh, thing called uh, a single root IO visualization. And um, the, the, oh, thank you. And uh, the, it allows us to do things like uh, safely assign a NIC to multiple VMs. And I know that this is going to sound very weird said like this, but um, some specific NICs uh, or any NIC that one can buy uh, for a server nowadays supports uh, SRIOV and it allows us to split that NIC into multiple um, virtual functions. So. This means that the, the NIC has the base a physical function that we expect a network card to have, but we ha can have uh, secondary uh, virtual functions that can also function like uh, network devices, but have some limitations. And those limitations exist to uh, guarantee safety. And, and uh, uh, we can get NICs that support until like 256 uh, virtual functions, and we can assign a single NIC uh, to a virtual machine, and those virtual machines have um, access to real hardware, and that's pretty cool. Um, I guess my time is pretty much over. And so virtualization is pretty cool, and that's all. Questions? No questions? Yeah. In the case of these uh, virtualization aware network interfaces, would each VM be assigned a different, let's say, MAC address? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, Okay, there are some options there, and there is also, um, I'm going to say yes, but the, the right answer is a little bit more complex than that. So you can not just give direct access uh, for a VM that you might or might not trust, uh, give uh, direct access to the wire to that VM. So most of the, uh, the, the NIC brands, at least SolarFlare and Intel, support a mechanism to filter out uh, and filter in uh, the, the packets that pass through. So uh, that's called queue splitting, uh, you, uh, and you are allowed to assign uh, specific TX and RX queues to that uh, PF. And 
Uh, so uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want uh, at L2, um, but there is safety there. Okay, thanks. Oh, here. Is there other class of devices in addition to network cards which can be used that way? Uh, not that I'm aware of, actually. Um, I uh, so um, the entity that comes up with this uh, is a PCI special interest group, and uh, every time that I start reading their specs, I kind of fall asleep. Uh, and I I mentioned uh, network cards because that's something quite important uh, for my company and is something that I deal with daily. And I guess. It's one of, I guess, uh, doing the same with GPUs would be pretty cool as well. Um, but with Nix, is doable now. Uh, where are most of the remaining performance limitations uh, in virtualization, or where is most of the work happening in terms of optimizing for performance? Um, right now, it's. Uh, uh, so uh, with with uh, uh, with hardware I/O virtualization, you can get very close to native performance, and at that point, it's mostly about the drawbacks. Uh, for example, um, by, by doing I/O virtualization, you lose some things like live migration. And for some use cases, that's quite important. So, but uh, in terms of speed, you can get very close to to native. Uh, thank you. <laughs>